Hey guys, this is Steven from the Green Engineers, and uh, let's go a little bit more in depth with this footage. Uh, I just graduated, uh, not graduated, but I just finished my last class, uh, or my last final of uh, university of my mechanical engineering degree on Thursday. Uh, today is 5-19-2019, and I finished on 5-16-2019. Uh, I said that a little bit in my last uh, video, talking about some of the things that are coming up. Uh, I went to uh, Maker Fair yesterday, so all pumped up. Uh, Maker Fair 2019, uh, I was not able to get into exhibit this year, but uh, super pumped up now because of, uh, because of Maker Fair, so ready to talk about more green engineer stuff uh, to get ready for uh, next year and uh, things to come. So uh, I wanted to take this time to talk a little bit more uh, past the 11 and a quarter minute video on uh, the uh, Phila factory and uh, what some different parts about it and what the future is uh, for this project. So uh, this guy here is my test bench. So let me go ahead and maximize here. This guy here is, uh, we cited, uh, again, this is a senior project for mechanical engineering at San Jose State University. I, I just made it part of a senior project. Obviously it's a company project for the green engineers. So, um, we decided as a group, and I decided as a group, from my knowledge that I learned from working part-time uh, at uh, Applied Materials to pay for this development of the Green Engineers, I uh, learned about doing all of this uh, kind of stuff of laying stuff out on a test bench. So we do a lot of stuff before we go into um, even do a full stand, we uh, validate things on a test bench, which is very, very popular for technology companies. So I decided to go with a similar route with the Phila factory starting out. So I don't know if I showed you guys the, um, um, I don't know if I showed you guys the, um, what's the term I'm looking for? I don't know if I showed you guys the, uh, the design of what the, what the extruder is actually going to look like. Cause obviously this is a test bench, not the actual extruder. So let me go ahead and show you guys what that model looks like. Why are you doing this? Oh, because it's in full screen, doesn't like that. Okay, let's drop it then. Okay, so let's go ahead and open this uh, assembly, and I'll go ahead and show you. So this is kind of a general assembly. I was just kind of moving stuff around, but this is what it's going to look like in actuality. So this this is how it sits on your table. The table is here. And let's say the wall is back here. So we're in the top view. In actuality, it's the front view. So in actuality, it's, it's like this. Um, so this is the floor down there, uh, which is the uh, uh, back plane, I guess you could say, down here. And this back is up against a wall, let's say. Oh, well, that's really weird looking. So basically, it's sitting just like this with this being the floor and this being the back. Obviously this winder is way too big for the housing, but um, so basically what we have here, hopper, barrel, uh, extrusion motor behind it. This is a uh, 60 tooth pulley with a 16 tooth pulley. Screw goes through here, nozzles down here, spooler, winder, dimensional control, and then a fan over here somewhere. Power supply, control, and then this is the, the motor for, <gasps> For the um, for the actual motor uh, for the for the spool itself, so basically it goes like this: pellets come down through here, go down, come out, come around, come through dimensional control, and then come up. And then there's supposed to be a pulley that comes uh, up here, or this will be mounted down here, and it'll come through here probably, wind down here. So this will probably be upside down, and so this will go. This will be facing down here. And then it'll come through here. There'll be a pulley here, and then this guy will be up here, and it'll come through and and wind it up here like that. So this is kind of the shape. This guy right here is exactly 45 degrees. 
Um, so what's going to end up happening is uh, because we have such a high extrusion rate. Sorry, my cat's kind of crying. Let me see what she's doing. Okay, she's just over there. Okay, because it has such a high extrusion rate, uh, we're going to need to snake the, uh, the filament around to give it more time to, uh, to um, solidify before it goes to the dimensional control. If you see, this thing here is hovering. So it will go maybe down here and around. Go down here and then go around a little bit before it comes back over here. It comes through this pulley and then goes up into the spool. And then we changed kind of the spool design. So we're going to use a similar design to what's actually on the test bench. So the test bench is supposed to simulate things uh, very, very closely to what it is on the actual machine itself. So let's go ahead and show you guys that. So if we go here, um, we'll go ahead, I have it muted, and we'll do kind of a rock walk around here, and I'll slow down and talk to you guys about the individual parts. So here, obviously this is a test bench. Uh, some of these parts are gonna be similar, other parts are not. So this is a NEMA 17 stepper motor. It's a little bit, it's about it's maybe slightly bigger than something you'd find on a, um, a regular 3D printer. Um, here's the stand, it's a PLA 3D printed. And then there's this uh, piece here that was supposed to be bolted, but I ended up just gluing it on. And what that holds is that holds a taper bearing. Let me show you guys that. I'm gonna show you guys that from Amazon. Yeah, I, uh, I was making sure I bought it on Amazon, I did. Actually, I can show you exploded view of what it looks like. Well, I actually didn't model it completely, so. Yeah, and I bought this one. I don't know if it's going to be exactly this one because I'll probably 3D print it because to make it lighter. But uh, here it is. So there's a taper roller bearing, um, which is uh, something that you would see on a spindle of a car. So basically what happens is um, it has this guy here is square as far as it's just a regular diameter. And then this guy is also square on the outside as a regular diameter. But on the inside, it actually has a taper inwards. So what happens is, in order to get the uh, bearing to work correctly, you have to smash this collar, and this collar goes on this way. So this, out, this OD collar goes on this way. So you have to smash this collar onto uh, this bearing, which is great, because that's exactly what we want here, because we want to build up friction on, uh, on this pulley here. But uh, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be designed differently on the uh, on the actual uh, on the actual unit itself, but we're going to use this concept of uh, using the uh, this uh, taper bearing because when you're going to install the spool, you're going to have it sitting down on a table like so. Take the cover off the top, um, pull the spool. There's going to be like a little nut here. You unnut it, pull the spool off, put the spool on, and then tighten it uh, quite a bit to preload this uh, this bearing here to get rid of any of the slop. And then what's going to actually happen is that this machine's only going to use um, it's only going to use uh, printed spools. Reason being is how it's actually going to work is this NEMA 17, which is the same NEMA 17 that you see here, this one here, or something similar to it, uh, is going to actually be have a cog on it, and it's actually going to drive um, a gear or basically teeth that are on the spool. So there's, there's gonna be teeth on the spool and then teeth on this gear here and the and the teeth on both are gonna move, uh, it's gonna move this guy and then this guy's gonna move uh, this guy. So it's gonna move, uh, uh, basically gonna move this spool by uh, grabbing onto the teeth here. Reason being is that we wanna maximize the height of this uh, spool that it will clear this box and in order to do that, my original design was just like the multi shooter which using the drive cones. But the drive cones lifted the spool up so much that I had to cut the diameter so small that this inner pin diameter was only like one inch. Because the big objective is to maximize this inner pin. Because I've had a lot of issues with um, some other manufacturer spools where they tighten it so tight around the center pin that there's so much stress on the filament that it just likes to crack and just becomes really, really brittle at the very end of the spool. So I wanna avoid that, so I wanna make this guy as big as possible, the center pin as big as possible. And I think right now it's like two and a half inches in diameter, which is pretty big. So 
Uh, that's the idea here is that this guy comes in with a hobbed gear with a gear and moves moves this guy around because there would be a gear on the bottom of this spool. And uh, so obviously it needs to be it needs to be a printed my own printed design spool for every material that you want because it has to have that gear on it and it has to be a certain diameter and it has to be at this uh, specific height when you shove it down onto uh, this uh, table roller bearing. But what this taper roller bearing allows you to do is it allows you to put a gear, uh, put a bolt on it and hold it up against something, but not increase friction, right? On a regular on a regular gear on a regular uh, bearing, uh, the the um, the piece is not really supposed to bear on this because this is turning one direction and this is turning another direction, or this is staying still and this one's turning. So you don't want it to uh, touch each other to uh, to kind of uh, increase friction. So um, that's really, really helpful because we could shove it onto that with a lot of, uh, with a lot of force here on this, um, on this nut. And another thing that really, really nice, which was a big issue with this guy, is that we're not reliant on friction. We're reliant on this gear down here. All this nut is doing is holding it onto this uh, taper roller bearing and holding it onto this gear so it doesn't slip off this gear. And the reason being is we had a big problem with this guy slipping um, out here with not having enough friction. But then again, we didn't put any cork or anything on it. So here's this piece. And so how this works on the test stand is that this is through hole. This goes through and then this, this rod is attached to the motor with a set screw. And then uh, this guy basically tightens down on the motor. But obviously you can't tighten down on this too much or you'll just pull the shaft right off the motor. So there was a limitation on what you could do. And, there's, and this has such, such impulse, or uh, I guess you could say acceleration almost. Acceleration and impulse. Uh, impulse is the, uh, is the derivative of acceleration. That this guy just slips, that it's, it, it, it's, it starts going so fast that this guy slips and it's really, really hard to keep this tight. And obviously, we should have uh, increased the friction onto this uh, pulley by putting some, I mean, onto the spool by putting some um, some cork on the back side of this pulley. <sighs> Sorry about that. It's early in the morning, so I had a little yawn there. Um, anything else here? That's pretty much it. But obviously, it's going to be quite a bit different. Uh, you're going to see a lot of this test stand once I get this test stand to work. Uh, fully, then I'll start working on this guy more and getting everything to fit inside the box. So uh, that is how the spool works, um, and it's going to be printed. Uh, it has gear gear tooth on the bottom, uses a uh, roller taper bearing um, to hold it in. To to hold it in so it doesn't droop or doesn't sag, and uh, also to allow it to spin at the same time. So. Yeah, that's uh, that one. And now let's talk a little bit about the winder. So the winder is going to probably be the same inside the box. It's just going to be shorter. So here we have, oh, another thing that I need to change is how many turns this pulley, this uh, this uh, spooler motor has. So uh, this guy is just a regular servo and it says it was four turn, but actually it turned out to be four turn one way, four turn the other way. So it's actually an eight turn when in actuality I only need a four turn, so we lost a lot of resolution there. Ended up buying some replacement uh, two turn. And this is actually the module for the multi-shooter itself. I mean, it looked really, really nice sitting here because it was the same size, even though this spool is gonna be a lot shorter. So it's gonna be a lot narrower, so this guy's gotta be a lot smaller. And uh, basically what it does is it has a regular 16 tooth pulley here, a 16 tooth idler pulley on this other side, and it has a carriage that goes back and forth and it has a Delrin bushing on the inside of the carriage. Now what we did is it has two holes on the top and we made a, um, a little wire uh, eyelet and glued it into one of those holes. So the filament goes through the eyelet, goes under this pulley, goes up through the eyelet and then starts wrapping underneath the spool. I don't know, I think it's actually over the spool. It's over the spool on this one. But well, we could have had it go under the spool, but it has to go over the spool in order to clear uh, from this pulley up. And everything here is in line from the nozzle, as you see this line that we had setting up. goes through the fan shroud, through the dimensional control, under the pulley, over the dimensional control, 
and onto the spool. And then the, the operation of the dimensional control is every time this stepper motor knows that it does a complete revolution, which is every, I think it's 200 steps, uh, 200 steps per revolution. Every time it does 200 steps, this guy will move one filament diameter. So that's whatever diameter you set inside of either the multi-shooter or the fill factory uh, firmware. So every time it does one revolution, it indents uh, one uh, step. So let's continue here. All right, so this pulley, it's just got a, a 608ZZ ball bearing in it. Uh, it'll probably be smaller inside of the box. I don't know if this is updated. Oh, it's not updated. So let's go ahead and update it. And while it's updating, we'll talk about it. So it's just got a 608ZZ ball bearing pressed into it and just got a, a bolt through this little stand. And this stand was actually just hot glued on there and it was actually strong enough to not get pulled off. But you can see that that makes this pulley really, really big. Oh, this hole's supposed to be over there. So it makes this pulley really, really big to have the, the 608 ZZ ball bearing in it. So I'll probably decrease the size of the ball bearing. So uh, we're probably gonna do that. Um, this guy, will, this pulley will probably be smaller. It doesn't need to be so big. Um, let's see, do we go back around? Oh yeah, we do, a little bit. And then the dimensional control, uh, it's just the regular multi-shooter dimensional control. Uh, probably nothing else uh, would be changed. Here it just has a stand to kind of make it uh, taller um, to get it to, to fit on the test stand. Obviously it would be different in here. And again, this uses the uh, the um, uh, linear motion potentiometer on the inside to check the distance uh, that this guy travels in order to measure the diameter of the filament. So this is a contact style, so we have to make sure that the contact is uh, good, uh, make sure that it's solidified by the time it comes down through here. So, that's basically it. I mean, it's very short summary but uh, it's one of the most important parts of the machine itself uh, the part itself would have a um, has a what's it called uh, um, a bushing on the inside which is a um, what's the word I'm looking for it has a uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene bushing on the inside and so that bushing is going to uh, uh, have a one eighth inch, uh, either aluminum or steel, probably steel, steel rod pressed through it. And now the steel rod is uh, just going to allow for, um, be stronger and not bend. And then it has this fork that uh, basically takes the load off of, uh, off of the, um, the, the rest of the components. Let me see if I can find it. It's up here somewhere. There it is. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Let's go ahead and show everything here. Okay, so here is the LMP linear motion potentiometer and it's threaded in. I'm actually going to have it threaded in up here, um, up here higher up uh, because down here oh, there's not enough room there. And then there's a eighth inch uh, a rod here, a steel rod that goes through. And then this guy is glued into the back of this guy. And then I don't have it modeled, but there will be a spring right here that pushes this guy into the filament. And so when this guy, when the filament pushes on this, it keeps it preloaded into the, into the filament. And what this allows, uh, allows us to do is it keeps it pressed, uh, this guy is actually going to be super pressed onto this flat piece here. And uh, that this flat piece will also probably be machined um, flat or even sanded flat so there's no bumps or anything so it's nice and smooth there. So it's going to be machined flat so it just rides back and forth on this piece here. Um, so it won't twist and won't do anything and this rod is way deep inside of here and it's really really close to this so this bushing here, so it's not going to allow for any sort of movement uh, back and forth. Speaking of which, this guy here has to be, this guy here should only be, um, um, uh, 
This guy here, I only want to be five millimeters. So obviously it's a little bit bigger than five millimeters. So there's gonna be a little bit more bending. Here's nine. So I'm gonna drop that down to five because again, this machine's only compatible up to five millimeters. So uh, I want it to only, uh, this be only five millimeters. So there's no way that this has very, very little moment here uh, because of it's so close to this really, really tight tolerance bushing that's, uh, that's gonna have, uh, it's gonna be drilled and then have a reamer sent through it. So it's gonna have to be really, really tight in order for uh, it to be good there. So that's kind of how that's gonna go. All right, so it goes back and forth here. Uh, this keeps it from going this way, this way, or up. Obviously, it can't go down because there's a wall there. And then uh, that basically attaches the linear motion potentiometer. So uh, this guy will be under very little stress. Also, it's adjustable because you can screw it in here and I'll probably put a bolt on here so it doesn't back out. Uh, but you could screw it in here until you hit zero, which will pull this out until you hit zero when it's hitting here, when the two pulleys are hitting each other. So it's basically configurable. So I'll have a little test stand for when I go into production with these things where you pull it out, you twist this guy by hand a little bit until it hits zero on this sensor and then you put a nut on it and then there you go, you're good to go. The zero, uh, the, the zero, zero on here is zero on, this, on the pulley. I mean it's zero here, zero millimeters and then you have full resolution, the full 1024 travel which is, a, it's a super amazing sensor. I'm super excited to start using. So this is the, um, this is dimensional control, super cool uh, piece of equipment. Uh, super excited to do uh, further testing on it. Let's go ahead and save. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's go back to the video. At what point are we at now? We're at 20 minutes. Okay. So uh, the last thing we'll do is we'll do the electronics. So that's this guy, that's this guy, uh, fan shroud. So fan shroud is probably gonna be a lot different, but this is kind of the concept I've been using, which is super, super cool. Um, I really like this idea of the fan shroud. So this is the fan shroud. So uh, probably gonna use a high pressure, very, very quiet, or maybe even, no need to worry about quiet because it's probably not gonna be louder than any of the motors, but put a 40 by 40 millimeter fan on here and it has this five millimeter plus a little bit gap here. And so basically what happens is that if you look at the section view, do I have section view? Yes, I do. So that's basically what it looks like. So it goes here and then it funnels everything up into this small little hole. And I think with my current fan, I think I have like, I think it's like a 15 mile an hour wind coming through here to go right across this filament. And this filament, it, this uh, opening here, I think is like, uh, five six inches but obviously what I would have is basically the limit of uh, of how long it's supposed to be so let's go ahead and change this so this guy will kind of I really really like how this is set up this is probably how I'm gonna run it on the test stand and then basically what's gonna happen is the shape is gonna change to follow what it ends up being inside the box so here's a four inch here's a four inch span so this guy you see on this video is right here printed and then here's the 40 millimeter fan. The 40 millimeter fan is pretty weak, but uh, that's okay. And then uh, we'll show you up on top kind of the setup of the barrel here, I think I show. Okay. So now basically with the barrel, um, the idea which I'll, uh, here's a picture, here's a video, and I had, I think I have another video showing up close. So this is just kind of a temporary setup here. Uh, so what we have here is we have the hopper at the top, and then there's an extension piece here. And the extension piece is what goes down to the barrel and basically adapts the barrel to the, ex to the extension piece. So this piece would be super tight once I get around to building the actual one, this actual piece here. This will be super tight to here to where this barely clears this plate right here. And this plate will probably be more machined later on. This will be super tight around this barrel here. So this guy doesn't have to clear much. And then over here will also be uh, tight as well. 
Then we have the 16 tooth pulley and the 60 tooth pulley. There's a belt, 200 millimeter belt that goes between here. And there's probably going to be a tensioner somewhere over here that tensions that pulley so it doesn't skip teeth. And then over here is a NEMA 23 on the back side, uh, 2.8 amp per uh, per coil uh, stepper motor. So basically, you put pellets in here, and if you saw inside of this, uh, there's a hole here that the filament goes into. Uh, speaking of which, let's open up the other video where we show the exploded view. Okay, so here's me kind of going over the uh, barrel itself. So here's the NEMA. Um, the barrel right now is unbolted as you see it twists. Uh, here is the um, hopper itself which theoretically fits one kilogram or really really close to one kilogram. Obviously there's going to be air gaps so it's not going to fit exactly one kilogram. Here is how the motor is bolted up to the torque plate I call it. And I took off the 60 tooth pulley. And so here you could see the start of the, um, the screw. And down here, this is the rest of the barrel. The barrel is 10 inches long. And here we have a thrust bearing. So a standard thrust bearing, just like the multi shear And the thrust bearing is super tight to this hole so that there's a little bit of air that comes out. And uh, So it can let any air out that needs to come out. Uh, because this is tilted at 45, we'll have gravity help with the pellets as well as we'll let air out through the top so we don't push the air into the uh, filament. Because another big issue with that is that a lot of extruders are sideways and the air has nowhere to go. So what happens is it presses the air into the filament and creates a little jacket of high pressure air around the nozzle. And as that pressure changes, it'll vibrate the filament diameter. So that's what causes a lot of inconsistency. So as you see here, I'm pulling out the uh, the regular metal auger screw uh, that I used in the multi shooter obviously and the fill factory is going to have a high performance screw which uh, I have here which is super cool I'm super excited to do it but I need a fourth axis which I'm working on uh, setting up a shop here at my house to start this start this business and start manufacturing so this guy is the um, the variable uh, inner diameter uh, screw so we have uh, a small diameter here to let all the pellets in and then it will actually compress three times its uh, volume. So the volume will decrease by three times and it will compress those pellets up against the wall. They're rubbing more and more and more and more against the wall and then as it gets to this point it's going to extrude. It has very very high pressure and this is just to make sure everything equalizes out and everything is melted as over here is the hottest area of the machine itself. But by the time it gets down here, it's going to be so hot that it wants to uh, come out. So obviously here, it's going to be low pressure, and then it th increases pressure by three times. So there's a uh, high pressure inside the barrel, low pressure outside the barrel. So the pellets want to leave, so they're going to take uh, the quickest exit out of the barrel itself and leave. So that is uh, what you see. That's what the actual barrel will look uh, That's what the actual... Um, a screw will look like. I'm still deciding whether uh, I'm going to decrease the screw size uh, and the barrel size because there's actually some uh, there's actually some rule of thumb um, um, guidelines online about different uh, different screw parameters that most people go with. So for example, one parameter is uh, and they're kind of all rule of thumb stuff and they're all just relationships, which is really really cool to. Uh, really easy to follow along with. So one is LD relationship. So that's length times diameter. Usually uh, the shortest screw, which obviously we have one of the shorter screws of an extrusion process, is 20 to 1. So what that means is that the length is 20 times the diameter. So in this case we have a 10 inch, so that means that we need a half inch screw. But uh, in a, a half inch diameter screw. But the issue with a half inch diameter screw is that it's too shallow that you can't actually get pellets in there. So this is kind of the best of both worlds. I can't remember if this one, I think, is this one a one inch screw? Because basically the one that I have in there is one inch. So yeah, this is a one inch screw. I'm thinking maybe a quarter, three quarter inch screw. We'll have to see. Because what that'll also do is it'll decrease this cross sectional area so that it uh, it heats up more up the barrel. 
And so yeah, there's just a regular modified screw. You've seen that before. And then here at the end, we have two 40 watt, um, just regular cartridge heaters from a 3D printer. So obviously I didn't have a chance to put a thermal resistor up over here somewhere. But these are uh, these ones during the test I just had run all out and I was able to start to melt the PLA against this nozzle here. Start to kind of uh, deform it a little bit. So obviously, uh, usually in the extrusion process, if you have a high performance screw, 75% uh, of the, the heat, or I think it's like half to 75% of the heat comes from the pellets rubbing against the sidewall of the barrel. And then obviously the rubbing and we're compressing against the, um, against the walls uh, with that three to one compression. Because those pellets are really, really thick. And when you're compressing like that, what you're doing is you're turning the torque of the motor into heat, right? or the power of the motor into heat. So that's uh, what the, the big deal with that is. So we're running this guy at 12 volts and that motor's at two and a half, uh, uh, almost five amps because it's uh, two coils. So you're talking about five amps. So that's 60 watts. So we could put up 60 watts there and 240 watts, 80 watts. So that's uh, um, 100 and, 140, uh, 100, 140 uh, watts of heat uh, maximum. And there I'm talking about where the barrel, the screw will actually end. It will end about here, um, even with the performance screw. So that's uh, basically the barrel there. Oops. I did not mean to do that. Okay, what else we have? Uh, final thing, so that's the barrel. Uh, final thing, electronics. We have two stepper drivers. So probably what I'm going to end up doing is trying to go for a smaller motor at the top because we have a really decent three, three and three quarter down gear because it's a 60 tooth pulley with relation to, to a 16 tooth pulley. I'm thinking that we'll probably go with a smaller stepper motor because what I want to do with these electronics is I want to put it all on like a ramps a DRV8825 stepper drivers. So uh, to be able to drive it on just a regular stepper driver without getting so much heat. And again, this is going to be inside of a box that inside is about 40 degrees centigrade. Because we have to hit 40 degrees centigrade because these power supplies start to give out at about uh, operating temperature about 40 degrees centigrade. They can't really keep themselves cool, especially with no fans. So I might put a fan on the stepper drivers to cool the stepper drivers and that fan will probably also double to cool the filament. So it will suck air over the stepper drivers and then blow it past the filament. So uh, so now it's running double duty, so we have less parts. So here, these are some big stepper drivers, but even these stepper drivers with this NEMA 23, it gets extremely hot uh, after some time. So right now it's mounted here, but it, I think it gets hot enough to melt the hot glue. So during an actual test, it'll, it'll fall, probably fall. But we have two of these guys, um, these guys, Again, they're, they were actually two, two and a half amp, I think. Let me see. Sorry that this video is running long. We're at 33 minutes. It's okay. Let me see. Okay, so this, 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 this is what they are here. Um, let's go ahead and minimize this. So this this is it. So these it says four amps. Obviously, we were pulling five amps, so uh, it doesn't quite have the amperage. But it says down here that its maximum uh, dissipation is uh, what was it? A hundred watts. It said somewhere. It said somewhere that it was a uh, hundred watt um, dissipation. So that uh, obviously we're way under that, but I think it was starting to. Um, I don't think it's exactly super rated for that. So, and obviously we don't have any fans going over this. This is all, uh, as you can see, the, the heat sink is facing up, but there's no fans or anything blowing over these things. So that's what we have. Uh, this is a 12 volt, 15 amp power supply, which would probably be what we would use for the project. And uh, you can see it is uh, modeled in here. That's this guy right here. Maybe we'll be able to somehow get the supply outside because we don't really have enough space but what i want to have the power supply inside is that this guy is about 90 percent efficient so it's going to dump the extra 10 percent is going to dump this heat on the inside to keep everything hot on the inside 
So we have uh, almost 100% efficiency of heat on the inside of this box. So I'd like to put the power supply in there, uh, somehow find a way to uh, fit the power supply inside. But that is this power supply's model there as far as the sil silhouette. Here you can see these are the motor wires itself. These are the motor wires itself. Uh, I'm looking at the long video. Here's a short video. Uh, what else? Arduino uh, Mega. Is Arduino Mega right here? I have a. Um, um, That's what I'm looking for. This is just a um, mechanical relay. Uh, probably just going to use MOSFETs, uh, like a normal heater, on the um, on the machine itself, on the regular ramps board, uh, ramps with a or ramps or a gerbil or something I'm not gerbil um, mainly like a, a ramps or MKS or something like that uh, and then on the other side I have um, underneath here I have a, a dual H bridge which I originally tried uh, to run these uh, stepper drivers uh, stepper motors but they're way too big for that guy so it started to get extremely hot and it would eventually start losing steps so I'm using that guy to regulate the 12 volts down to 5 volts because putting 12 volts into Arduino and relying on that internal voltage regulator is kind of scary so I just had that guy with a bigger voltage regulator regulate for this guy and also that guy's sending power to uh, the, the servo but in actuality the servo will probably run on 6-7 volts to keep the torque high all right, so that's pretty much it for the test stand and kind of very, very similar to what it would be inside the filler factory. Obviously here, it's just test stand. There is no interface uh, on the on the actual uh, fill factory. It'll probably be the exact same software as multi shooter So uh, when I develop for one, it'll develop for both. And then this is kind of something the group wanted to do. They bought some, plec they bought some uh, acrylic to kind of put it in a box. So it kind of simulate what it would look like inside of the fill factory so um this this will obviously change a lot of things because we can't contain the heat as well as inside the box and this thing is three feet long here this is a three feet long run but inside the box is only 12 it's only 12 inches by 12 inches by five and a half inches so this is kind of more of like a lyman mueller style of uh, extruder so uh that we're going to be very difficult to emulate so, um, yeah, but we'll get it to work here. And if it, get, if it works here, it's going to work even better inside of the, inside the housing because we have 48 Watts. Cause usually on this, once the 48, once the heat leaves and comes down here and goes to the winder here, that heat's pretty much gone. But in the actual box, the heat is still there because this spool is inside of the, inside of the box. So I'm thinking that we could probably keep the 40, the 40C uh, heat inside, and we'll lose, and it'll probably keep around 40, 40 uh, degrees centigrade inside the box because we're going to lose a little bit through the bottom and through the sidewalls and through the top uh, PLA see-through uh, panel. So we're going to lose a little bit here and there. All right, so. Let's go ahead and look at the fun stuff. So what we were able to do, uh, again, we weren't able to do this guy because uh, we weren't able to run the extruder because of some of the hit and miss uh, availability of the shop.build because it's starting to lose uh, some of its uh, availability because of financial issues. So we uh, there it was very hit and miss as far as being able to run stuff like that, uh, being able to do more parts. So, but we were able to get the winder and the spooler to both work and, uh, and uh, be synchronized. So let's go ahead and show what that looks like. So we have two, we actually have a couple views of it. So let's go ahead and one. Shit, it's not fitting in, there it goes. So that was a fail. Three, two, one. So you can see this guy is moving here. You can see the winders moving here. It's moving similar to what it would be. Uh, it's actually not reading this guy. I just kind of eyeballed it on the speed because at this point it's about four o'clock in the morning. Uh, so we just wanted to get done with the project because we were presenting the next day. So we just wanted to get this over with. But you can see that it's winding back and forth, very similar to how fast this guy's moving.
Obviously, this is super exaggerated because this guy would be spinning very, very slowly. I think it's like 18 RPM, I think it is. Right now, I think it's spinning 90. So it's spinning like uh, six times or, or five times the, uh, the amount that it should be spinning. So it would be spinning five times slower than it is now. And then this guy would be moving five times slower. But I have another view for you guys. This is way better view. Two, one, go. And then you can see here that it goes under the pulley and it kicks out. So that's good because the pulley's working that it allows it to kick out and go from here to here, here to here, here to here, and not come off the pulley. But again, here, Anthony's standing behind here holding it taunt. And then this again, this is twine to kind of simulate uh, the uh, filament itself. So the, this guy is not quite perfect, just a little too fast. You see this guy's moving just a little too fast. We have a little bit of gaps. And here it goes back. And when it goes back, it doesn't quite go all the way over. So you just go over just a little bit more. But over here it's fine. Over here it just needs to go over a little bit more. And so obviously this guy could be about half the size here. Um, it could be about from here to here. So we could probably even get away with even less turns of this guy. So maybe even uh, two turns. Uh, uh, two turns this way, two turns this way. Or one and a half turn this way, one and a half turn this way. Or one turn this way, one turn this way. So it would be a one turn instead of a two turn. Because so a two turn, what we find out, found out is two turns this way, two turns this way. Um, so we'll get really, really high resolution. We could do really, really small filaments and get really, really high resolution here. But as you see, well, let's go ahead and watch it one more time. Two, one, this go. was a big time in the making. This was a couple years in the making to get this to work properly. Um, and this is a big deal. And a lot of its shooters, this is like $900 to get this to work uh, correctly. And obviously, another thing that this proves is that we were holding a little bit of tension on this guy. It indeed proves that you can pull with the spring with the uh, with the spool and not have any issues so you can indeed not have because most uh, most extruders that you use this principle they have a second motor with two with two rollers that grab onto the filament and pull the filament out so this is showing that you can indeed pull the filament and wind it at the same time but then again obviously the filament is a little bit more um, rigid than uh, some twine, but um, that being said, it does show that you can indeed pull because we are pulling with some tension there and it is pulling here. And uh, obviously this is going to have some sort of gearing ratio to it. This is going to be geared to the pulley itself. So we're going to get quite a bit more uh, force on it as well. So. That indeed works, so that's a big deal because I think this is the first time it's ever been tried as far as not using the rollers to pull it before it gets wound onto the spool. So it's actually using the spool and eliminating an entire extra module. So uh, because with that you have to sync the two, you have to sync this motor up with the puller motor and then you have to have a whole nother step motor, a whole nother step driver and a whole nother room for that and we didn't have any we don't have any room in this box so minute uh, eliminating a motor was a big deal so this was this is a big step forward so now we have to this works we have to miniaturize it uh, get it to be fully synchronized get it to extrude on the test bench get it to wind it up and then use the filament and once everything there works then we start to get it ready for production and what are we doing to get ready for production? When I say we, uh, the team might be involved, team might not be involved. Um, mainly it's going to be me in this garage that I'm cleaning up now uh, because we made a mess of it during the senior project. Uh, over here we're going to have some tools to make, we, uh, me and maybe somebody else, we're going to have some tools to uh, build these machines. Um, but the next step would be once everything here works, then it's going to start to be uh, what bearings are we going to use, what motor selection, who, what manufacturer, what machines are we going to use to manufacture this, uh, what fan motor are we going to use, what filament manufacturer are we going to use, are we going to make our own filament, we'll probably make our own filament to make all these parts. Um, 
and basically finalize the design and finalize the uh, the best parts where we get these parts um, and in what order and what machines we manufactured on and uh, that kind of jazz and also the electronics so once this works we'll probably next step is to get everything to work with the ramps board start to compact everything compact everything and finalize all the vendors the code base uh, the firmware to run this guy the interface that you use to interface with this guy how we're gonna get PLA sheets and all that kind of stuff all right so this has been Steven uh, from the green engineers I like thank you guys for watching this video and I will see you guys in my next video. This will be my first video in the Phil Factory tab, uh, my Phil Factory playlist. So keep posted on the Phil Factory playlist to see the next coming uh, videos on this project. Uh, so thanks for sticking along with uh, this almost 45, 50 minute video. Uh, the rest of the videos after this will probably be way shorter uh, talking about just things that I've changed so obviously before you look at those videos, make sure that this that you check this one out to the end to understand what happens with this test bench. So uh, more updates coming soon on the multi-shooter, uh, the machines uh, that are going inside this garage on this shelf back over here, and uh, also all the other things that are happening. So I will see you guys in my next video. Please subscribe if you're not already subscribed, and I'll catch you guys later. Thanks for watching. Take it easy. Peace.